than what we normally use, and yet one that I feel is very essential, very much needed in the times in which we live. I want to speak on the subject, where is Springfield headed? Where is Springfield headed? I want to read one verse of scripture found in the 33rd chapter of the book of Psalms, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. This is the first Sunday of the new year. This new year can be great for all of us. It will offer us many wonderful opportunities. There will also be some problems to overcome. We should begin the new year by conscientiously facing ourselves. What do we believe about certain things? What are our first priorities? What will our attitude be concerning our city? Concerning good morals, concerning our home, concerning our church, concerning our individual lives. Will we stand for good, solid city government? Will we have the conviction and courage to stand against those things that are detrimental to our city? I'm sick and tired of the blatant discriminators who criticize, blister, and damn good, solid, fundamental, conservative people who stand for what they believe. But if one dares to oppose them, they scream to high heaven, bigots, fanatics, and accuse them of trying to legislate morals. Believe me, there are some things that are wrong. No matter what we or they say about them. And I'm going to mention them this morning. I'm not going to talk about generalized sin. I'm going to talk about our city, the things in our city. And we need to be warned from God's Word. First, I want to say that I love and respect our city. My family has lived here for 39 years. My children were educated here. But I want us to look at some things that are in our city today and then bow our head in shame. First of all, we have raw pornography of the worst sort. I mean, as bad as they print. You can buy it in little old grocery stores, anywhere you want to go. Pornography could be put out of our city. Fortunately, one of the few things our Supreme Court has ruled recently that's good. They ruled that a city had, to right, had a right to determine what pornography is and then judge accordingly. Now when I say that it could be put out, it's inevitable that I'm referring to certain people. There's only one way to put it out and that's to put it out lawfully. We must go through the proper channels. 
I have reference first to our city attorney. This attitude of I won't prosecute unless I'm sure I can win is a cop-out. And that's all it is. You don't know whether you can win or not till you try. And I say this very sincerely. It would be a feather in an attorney's cap if he tried, even if he failed he'd win the respect of the majority of the citizens of this city. But the fact is, other cities have succeeded in putting pornography out of their city because the city attorney and the officials who were responsible, they set out to do it. And they did it. Even a few of the large cities. Springfield put pornography out at one time before it became such a large industry in our city. I remember we, I was with a group that helped bring it to the attention of the Springfield people and of our officials and they ruled the place, the, the magazines that were being sold in these newsstands these particular newsstands as being pornography and close their doors. But at that time we had a city attorney and a judge that had conviction. And they did it lawfully. We have in Springfield an unholy abortion clinic. In my opinion and according to the Bible, abortion in plain terms is the murder of unborn babies. You can't make it anything else. This is a blight on Springfield that cannot help but bring the judgment of Almighty God upon our city. Please remember the city of Springfield, listen, the city of Springfield had to license the abortion clinic for it to operate, thus putting their approval as city government upon it. We have at least one and probably more X-rated theaters in town that show movies that are not fit for the devil to see. I believe he'd blush if he attended one of them. We have a nightclub in our city that has nude dancers in a little city of Springfield nestled in the Ozarks. It's called the Crazy House Lounge. I have one question to ask. Do these things improve the character and morals of our city? Then we have massage parlors that are only a front for illicit sex. You say, but they're not in the city limits, but they're in the county limits. And we have a county government, and we have a county sheriff, and we have county law enforcement officers. Make no mistake about it. These things are corrupting our city. When I said a moment ago, and I said in the little write-up we had in the paper, are you willing, as we face a new year, to stand against the things that are corrupting our city? These are the things that, I'm, that I had reference to. We cannot help but ask Springfield when we see these things. And then thinking back, when we voted in gambling in our state, statewide, we cannot help but ask Springfield, where are you headed? 
Where are you headed, Springfield? I think we would profit a great deal from reading again Psalms 32, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. Mind you, it does not say the church, the denomination, but it says the nation. Listen again to Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Listen again to a prophetic word by Isaiah. In Isaiah 34, verses 1 and 2. Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. And here's the, here's the statement. He says, here's what I want the whole world to hear. Here's what I want the nation to hear. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. Why? Why is the indignation of the Lord upon all nations? I don't think I need to answer that. Because of sin. Because of their endorsement of pornography. And we do. City of Springfield, Springfield officials, we do as a city endorse and tolerate and permit raw pornography. We did as a city license an abortion clinic to destroy unborn babies not wanted. Make no mistake about it. God's judgment will be upon those nations, states, and cities that tolerate the, the, the license and license, tolerate and license this kind of blatant sin. We cannot overlook it. And God will not overlook it. God has given a mandate to his preachers in this respect. Listen to Isaiah 58, 1. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sin. Now God says, preachers, here's what, here's what your attitude ought to be. Here's what I'm expecting of you. First of all, cry aloud. Get up on the housetops. Cry aloud enough for people to hear. Lift up your voice against the sin and iniquity of this nation. That's what he's talking about. It's not ours to decide, it's ours to obey. And I can say and feel that I'm on scriptural ground when I say it, that we have to make a decision in Springfield that we're going to stand for the things of righteousness or we're going to vote by our silence to bring the judgment of Almighty God upon our city. I would not dare place such an indictment upon our city and upon our people without also offering a remedy or rather informing you of the remedy that God Almighty has offered. And there's only one remedy for sin. Only one. And that remedy is Jesus Christ. Let the world say what they will. 
Let the drinking, carousing, gambling crowd say what they will. God Almighty made this earth. God Almighty populated this earth. And the God that created us has a right to govern us. When a nation ignores Jesus Christ, they're asking for it. When a city ignores the laws of God, they're asking for it. Sin is a reproach to any people. God's Word says, and the only remedy for sin in this world is Jesus Christ. There is no other. You can't legislate righteousness. I think we ought to, we ought to legislate <coughs> righteous principles, laws based on righteousness. But in reality, you cannot legislate righteousness. That's a matter of the heart. Salvation's not a matter of, of your education or your intellectuality or your psychology it's a matter of the heart with the heart man believeth unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation we've got a heart trouble today our nation our state our city our church our individual lives. We have heart trouble. We've got to get down to the source. What's responsible for the things that have captivated our city today? And it can be summed up in one little word. S-I-N. Sin. Sin is to blame for it all. There are several things about Jesus Christ we need to understand if we're going to deal with the sin problem. First of all, who he was. He was not just another man. He was not just a great philosopher. Jesus is the Son of God. Literally, God manifest in the flesh. He's equal with the Father in every divine attribute. He was in the beginning with the Father. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Then we need to think about what he became. If we really understood this, not just doctrinally, not just theologically, if we really understood, first of all, he became man. God became man. Yes. In Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin conceived and brought forth a son, and they call his name what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. He was born of a virgin and took upon himself the body of a man, a fleshly body was tempted in all points, such as you and I, yet without sin. He was a man, but he was the perfect, sinless son of man. And in so doing, <clears throat> he became flesh by means of the virgin birth. And then we get to the important thing in redemption. Jesus became sin. 
I think I can understand the first better than I can the second. He became man by means of the virgin birth. But then the scripture says, He who knew no sin became sin. I wish I had some way to describe that. Jesus reached out with his long arms and gathered together all the sin of all generations, of all times, gathered it unto himself, and said, Father, I take the responsibility for every one of these sins, every crime that's been committed, every murder, every act of adultery, every theft, Every blaspheme, every sin that man since Adam until the last man is born into this world, I take the responsibility of all of that sin. Let it rest on me. And the scripture says, it pleased God to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. God took that sin and he who knew no sin became the very incarnation of sin by accepting the responsibility of it and not only of sin but of its penalty as well. Let the penalty, Lord, Father, let the penalty that would be upon the sinner let it rest upon me. Let me bear it. Concentrate all the fires, the agonies of hell, and dip them into my soul. And he made his soul an offering for sin. Not just his body, but he made his soul an offering for sin. Jesus became sin. Why? that you and I might be made righteousness in him. We're made righteous because he was made sin for us and paid the penalty for us. Then we need to understand what he did. First of all, please understand this, he condemned sin in the flesh. How did he do that? By living a perfect, sinless life without sin, though he was tempted in every point, such as we are. Yet the scripture says, without sin. Sin did not touch him. The guilt of sin, that is the personal guilt of sin, was never upon him. But all the guilt of sin, as far as the lost world is concerned, was placed upon him. And he who knew sin, knew no sin, became sin. But he condemned sin in the flesh. Living a perfect sinless life and then dying. And making an acceptable atonement for sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Then he died for sin, that he might bring us to God. Why did he die? Sin separated between you and your God. But Jesus died in order to bridge the gulf and bring the sinner back in reconciliation with God by his acceptance of Jesus Christ. And that's God's only plan. There is no other. And then he arose from the dead. Let me tell you something. You leave out the resurrection of Christ and you leave out the whole gospel. It is the capstone of the gospel. He died. He was buried. That's wonderful. But what then? 
He arose again from the dead, triumphant over sin, death, and hell. He said, I'm alive forevermore. He arose for our justification. Oh, my friend, the work is done. Someone wrote a great song with that title, The Work is Done. But it is. Everything that's necessary, everything the law required, everything that God the Father requires, everything that the Godhead required, all has been finished. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left its crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Salvation can be yours through Jesus Christ. But I want you to listen to this last statement. Your destiny depends upon what you do with Jesus Christ. Not only that, the life that you live down here on this earth depends upon what you do with Jesus Christ. You have a tremendous responsibility. You can accept it or you can reject it and pay the eternal consequences. Or so doing. But the decision is yours. And we stand together with our heads bowed.